This is Dr. David Proden, and I want to thank you as we begin another journey into school and community safety. If you're looking for industrial safety expert, Appalachian State University professor, Dr. Timothy Ludwig, please visit www.safety-doc.com. Again, that's Dr. Timothy Ludwig at www.safety-doc.com. Welcome to the Safety Doc Podcast with author, radio host, and nationally recognized safety expert, Dr. David Perotin. Join us each week as we discuss the best and most bizarre practices in safety preparation and crisis response. Follow Dr. Perotin on Twitter at SafetyPhD. And remember, the truth will keep you safe. Hi, everybody. This is Dr. David Perotin, and welcome to the Safety Doc Podcast. It is a brisk 61 degrees on the North Star weather dial, which is warmer than it's been. It was actually 60 degrees outside today. Winter may finally be behind us here in Wisconsin. Out of all the years, folks, this is probably the most brutal, longest winter that I've experienced. And now, unfortunately, we are entering the flooding stage. Will not impact us here on the top of the hill, but there are so many places where it's frozen a foot deep, and all of the runoff and the rain we've had recently is resulting in flooding. So really tough here in southern Wisconsin for people who dealt with floods last fall and again are dealing with them this spring. I recently purchased a new Garmin for my Buick to replace the one that was lost in my crash back in January. Um, Love the new one, by the way. It's great. Um, Larger screen, higher definition, more intuitive, just a really nice unit. Um, But you cannot select um, like a a fire truck or any type of race car, anything like that. Those options are kind of (laughs) gone. And I really liked that on the previous Garmin because I had a little fire truck that would be on the map and that would be me. So I had to pick from a car or a triangle or a truck or something else. And and I'm thinking, why isn't this an option? Like how how much memory does it take to (laughs) have a couple of these little images um, on that you can either download or they're just built in and you can select from them. So, or that you could have your own, you know, I don't know, but a little bit of a disappointment. So I am now a blue car, even though I own a white car. Um, but it is a very nice addition to the vehicle. I'm not big into using my phone for navigation because I want to be able to, um, you know, charge the phone and kind of have it out of the way. And then if a call comes in, I have it synced so it'll, I can just press a button um, on my steering wheel and, and the call will pick up. And, and then there's the high-definition display built into the dash, which you have to pay for navigation. Well, I guess you can sync it to the phone, but then you're using your phone minutes. And then also, like, then you have to look over at that, which is down a little bit. And your eyes aren't on the road where the Garmin sits on this beanbag base. Really nice on the dash. So your, your eyes just have to glance a little bit over. You're keeping your eyes on the road. Um, so I appear to have lost a lot of Twitter followers in the last day. I don't know. You, the listener, can follow the show at SafetyPhD, at SafetyPhD on Twitter. Follow. You'll find me, the Safety Doc. I would appreciate it. So a few shout-outs before we get rolling here in the anecdotes and then into the show. Uh, shout out to the 405 Media out of Los Angeles, California. The 405media.com airing the Safety Doc podcast, 2 p.m. PST, daily, Monday through Saturday, on the 405media.com. Check out the League of Extraordinary Podcasters on the 405media.com. A shout out to radio and podcast. 
This show is now part of the radio and podcast lineup. Check them out at radioandpodcast.com. Jim Mallard is the curator of that site, also has the Mallard Report, and you might want to check that out because he has phenomenal guests, including he's had Roger Stone on his show a few times, uh, Jim Mallard and the Mallard Report. Also, a shout out to Sprigio, S-P-R-I-G-E-O.com, Sprigio.com, the nation's leader in online school safety and community safety reporting, Sprigio.com. I'll actually be doing more with Sprigio upon my retirement, which is now, I believe, 55 or 54 work days away. So, Approaching that and very excited to be doing more. Have worked with Sprigio for a number of years, uh, specifically with their user interface and looking at their data systems. They are exceptional folks, Sprigio.com for school safety. I had a fascinating discussion. So I want to talk about just how these things that we don't expect can randomly happen and, and, and really change our day and and maybe change our outlook on a lot of things. So I had a fascinating discussion. I took my vehicle in for its first oil change. Um, And I was waiting in the, the what waiting area, I suppose, of the dealership. And there was another lady there, an an older uh, lady. And and we just did some you know, casual discussion about, oh, it's, you know, it's warming up outside and what kind of vehicle do you have and what kind of vehicles she had and, and some things like that. And somehow um, we stumble across a discussion about the work that I do as a school safety expert. And I guess it wasn't so much a stumble in that I had a portfolio um, on my lap and I was taking notes. And so I was obviously working on something. So it'd be natural to say, well, looks like you're pretty busy there. What are, you know, what do you do? What are you working on? So, uh, I was glad to take a break from that. And I, I, I said, well, you know, I'm in, in the school safety and I'm kind of retired, but now I'm doing other things in school safety, more consulting, more university instruction. And, and, uh, she shared, that her husband had been a school superintendent um, several years ago, and he had, you know, since um, you know been retired, I think for like 20, 20 years, something like that. And she, so we had this connection. She knew the field. She she knew what I was talking about. Um, so we we were talking about the the rapid melting of snow and flooding, and she said, you know, uh, about ten years ago, um, our basement flooded. So she's telling me this story. She said our basement flooded, and we had we had about two feet of water in the basement, and you know everything had to be ripped out. And I said, "Oh, I said, yeah, I know it's it's horrible, and it's happening to a lot of people now. Um, just how disruptive that is." And she said, "Yeah, we had to change things up on you know the the way that the it was kind of a, a fluke thing. We had a lot of rain um, that year. There was uh, actually a major um, a, a, a lake." breach and it completely emptied out about 15 miles from here. But, um, but I asked her, I said, how did, how did people respond to that? How did your neighbors respond? How did the government respond to that? What was, what was the response? Tell me what you, what you recall from that. And then I just, uh, I turned to the listener and let her tell her story. And, and she said, well, you know, our neighbors were aggressively trying to prevent this lake in the town from eroding um, a road and then if it would have eroded the road, the, the lake would have basically emptied out. So they were frantically working on that, plus, you know, the fire department. And they did manage to, to save that. That's where the resources were kind of at. But she said, you know what? Uh, FEMA came into town, and uh, they stopped at our house, and they knocked on the door. And they said, do you need any help? And we said, yeah, we've got water in the basement. We've got two feet of water in our basement right now. And they said, well, we can help you. And I said, oh, well, it's, it's pretty great. You know, when I hear about FEMA, I usually don't hear of the response this rapid. So, um, but we're near a major metropolitan area. So maybe that had something to do with it. And I said, well, what did that look like? How did they help you out? And she said, they brought a bucket, <laughs> a mop, bleach, and a sponge. And they gave this to us and said, here you go. 
And she said, well, I have two feet of water. How am I going to get this water out of the, the basement? I mean, is there a pump? Can you suck this water out? Can anybody help me? But no, this is what they had. And she said the irony of how insufficient that was um, was highlighted when they used the mop. It was either her or her husband used the mop, and within a, a minute or two, the handle snapped in half. <laughs> And she said her husband was a tall man, so he couldn't use bend down and use the shorter version of this this mop. So then she ended up using it. And but uh, she wasn't sure eventually how the water, if it drained out, or, or if neighbors came by, or if the fire department a pump or something. But it was a fascinating story about how we respond in a crisis. And and we we got to talking later. She said, well, "Why'd you ask that question?" I said, "Well." I said, it's, it goes into social contract theory. And this is something I study. It's about how um, neighbors and, and basically um, good Samaritans like um, Triton, um, the Triton Relief Organization back um, with Hurricane Florence. Um, also, uh, a couple of years ago, Hurricanes Irma, Harvey, Cajun Navy Relief. I said, those types of organizations which come in and and just and just neighbors helping neighbors, you know, whether somebody has a pump or or if they're using buckets, whatever they're doing. And I said the FEMA response is interesting because, um, you know, we've been taught for so many years to invest in the social contract that the government will be there to help us during sentinel events. Um, and for this lady, obviously, the the house flooding, you know, to to two feet, but two feet, she was saying, you know, we had to rip out the carpeting and the paneling and drywall and all that. I mean, significant. But um, this was the government response. And what we're seeing, though, you know, I was talking about social contract theory. I said we're seeing so much more of this organic grassroots um, nonprofit response, like from Triton Relief. And I had Katie Pachan on a show earlier and actually had her on a show a few years ago when she was with Cajun Navy Relief. And I said, there's a change that's happening right now where more people are going away from the government during times of crisis and going toward these grassroots organizations, which are not only their neighbors, but are people coming in, volunteers to help out. And I said, that switch on paper from a research standpoint looks like that happened around 2011. And there'll be people who could argue that, but I would say from the base of research that I've examined and from the people in the research community that I've spoken with, it's pretty solid. The 2011 was kind of the turning point when more people drifted away from the government and drifted toward um, a safety response that would be from a private organization, um, a nonprofit, their neighbors, things like that, and, and not FEMA. And I told her about how we also see this, where people are using social media, Zello and apps and things like that, not necessarily using 911, which, which she thought was fascinating. So I had a captive audience. She, really, she said, I really enjoy hearing this. Like, this is a, this is a terrific discussion. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I've, I've got quite a bit here um, if you, if you want to listen. So it was a fun conversation for me. I could tell she greatly appreciate listening to this. And there was just this soap opera kind of on TV in the background, nobody else in the waiting room. So I guess I was the better option of the two. So her car was ready before mine and, and the, the service technician came in and, and said, you know, it's ready. You can go out and pay. And before she left, she turned to the technician and, and she, she told him, she said, what luck for me to be here today in this waiting area for the last hour and this gentleman is here, and we've had just this incredible discussion, this conversation. And she said, I'm so lucky I was here today. I'm like, oh, my goodness. That was really nice of her to say. And before she left, she said, I know you mentioned you had a, a book that was released. Um, how would I get it? And I said, um, here, I have a card. This is my portfolio. And I have many business cards <laughs> in here because this travels with me. I said, if you just go to the website, there's a link you can write on the side. It'll say, you know, the book and, and School of Airs, go to it. And uh, I said, I think you'd enjoy it. 
she actually uh, visits her library a lot and was very versed in areas of not only education, but just kind of general interest. So I, I do think she'd enjoy it. Um, so I was honored. I was humbled. And I probably spoke too much. Uh, but I was, I was on a roll. And it was in a good way. I was talking about how we need to study process and how process will help us with better outcomes. And the fact is everybody looks for blame. And that's something people ask me when I'm brought in as a consultant of what went wrong. Like, let's pinpoint what went wrong. It's not so much a mechanical failure. That's not the way that school safety works. It's usually something in the system or the entire system that could be improved. And the fact that the system is improving would result in a better outcome. So I talked about that too. And it, it just reminded me as she talked about that, about the social contract theory and how I wrote about it in the book. And I was writing about it more present, but really it extends back to when she's talking about 10 years ago when their house was flooding and FEMA knocks at the door and is willing to offer a bucket and a mop and some bleach and no elbow grease and kind of here you go and here's what the next house gets in the next house the next house that one size fits all and it really didn't work probably for anybody so i had a great time it was uh it was fun and i was also happy that i wasn't boring <laughs> she really did seem excited and uh i i think if she would have been bored she could have kind of walked around the showroom or gotten herself a cup of coffee or something like that so um my book, School of Airs, Rethinking School Safety in America, is out now. You have to obtain it through pre-order, though. So you can go the best way, it probably is Amazon.com. Just type in my name or School of Airs. Um, schoolofairs.com is another way to check out. I have that domain. It just bing goes right over. It's a proxy. It goes over to Amazon. Roman and Littlefield, the website, Barnes & Noble, um, so I, I think the the lowest price is available on Barnes and Noble right now. So uh, School of Airs, and I, I really call it the most honest book that's ever been written on school safety. And I'll stand behind that because I it, it's rhetoric free. I've I have over seventy citations in it. Um, very much mirrors the approach I took in 2013 in my PBS presentation on school safety. So it is something that has many interesting, engaging stories in it. Um, and then also gets at these, these big themes of why you can't fortify for school safety. And there, there are some talking points that I'll add to that in time that I couldn't include in the book because I only had so much real estate to write on. Um, you know, I had a page range, but there was something I didn't mention in the book that I am going to mention when I talk about the book, and that is people rush to fortify environments, and they believe that fortification is the path to safety. And I argue fortification is one part of safety, but the other part is identifying and reporting threats, and those need to be on equal footing, and they're not. They're, they're just simply not. And we can look at bills, legislative bills, and we can look at funding, and we can easily see that fortification receives 80 to 90% of the attention in both of those areas. But a problem with fortification is when you think about fortifying a school, you think of a school, a building, one building that was maybe built at one time, not added on to several times over several years. You don't think of the literally thousands of portable school buildings or modular buildings, basically mobile homes, which are plopped down next to schools when there's overcrowding or this is gonna be our new alternative school, so it's on school property. And those are largely unregulated. There was an article that came out and talked about Washington State and the state of Oregon of how that's really unregulated as to how long these things um, are supposed to be in service, the level of, you know, um, the, the way that they're built and they're insulated and things like that. And, it, and just all of that, it's kind of like, a lot of these regulations don't apply. And we know now when we build schools, we have very specific requirements for entrances. So people are going through multi-steps to get into schools. 
um, cameras, all of these types of things are just inherent to new school design. Yet if that school becomes overcrowded and you bring in these portables, these modulars, which are, again, thousands of these across the country, um, those do not have the same level of security. By far, they don't have the same level of security. So even if you talk about bollard fencing, which I talk about in the book and, and that going up in front of schools, it's, you're not going to bollard fence in front of a of a mobile home that hopefully if your referendum passes in spring or fall, you'll have another new school going up. So we do have these very weak areas. And people forget too that when you think of schools, schools partner at the younger levels for early childhood with community settings. So the 4K setting might be in the basement of a church or might be partnered with a preschool. So again, areas where you're not going to have bollard fencing, bulletproof glass and check-ins, things that you'll have at the same level of a high school, for example. So we do have all of these branches. And the other part is online education, students who are taking their classes online or partially online. So that's where, if we get into threat identification reporting, is very significant because when we, you talk about bullard fencing around one school, think of everything that's being exempted from that, all of this modular, these modular classrooms. You know, one, one structure can have four classrooms, four classrooms, 20 students, four teachers, 84 people in one building. And that building probably has zero security features to it other than the lock on the front door going into the building. And because it's on school campus, you're probably not unlocking and locking that building every time you're going in. Thank you for tuning in to the Safety Doc Podcast with the nation's leading safety expert, Dr. David Perodin, author, radio show host, university instructor, researcher, expert witness, and consultant. Powerful testimonials. Dr. Perodin has a strong reputation as the go-to safety consultant, and he was still able to exceed our expectations. When we went looking for an expert in the field of crisis preparedness and prevention, David was the single person we pursued. Not easy stepping into the touchier subjects of life, but Dr. David pulls it off. Take a listen. Now, back to Dr. David Perodin and the Safety Doc Podcast. March 25th, I will be interviewing attorney James Sibley. James Sibley, he is a disability rights attorney, has done much with youth with disabilities. Um, So we are going to focus on a few topics, and one of those will be this trend of schools exempting students with disabilities from participating in safety drills. So in this episode of the Safety Doc Podcast, we are talking about confirmation bias and the implications it has for school safety. Now, I mentioned confirmation bias um, several times in my book, but not by that term. Um, I described it. And there were a few times in the book when I left out specific terms because I wanted people to sometimes if you present a specific term like confirmation bias, someone's like, okay, I got it. Like, I don't really need to pay attention to this section. So I kind of just left the term out. And I introduced a lot of new thinking, simulated annealing, um, projected benchmarking, things like that, where I I didn't want to get too inundating with terminology. But confirmation bias, something all of us have. And it's not necessarily bad, but it can be bad. Um, and it can be very bad when it comes to school safety, but let's get an understanding of what confirmation bias is. So I'm gonna begin by sharing a story of when I attended a school safety conference. And this was a conference for school safety experts. Now experts I'm doing the air quotes with, and that is because um, some of these folks are just assigned the school safety coordinator for their school district of 200 students and going to this conference bequeaths them with this title of school safety coordinator. They haven't gone 
through any courses or anything like that to obtain this title. And, and now there are some certifications that have emerged out there. And I think that's just because people realize if they put some certifications out there, people will <laughs> take these classes and say, I'm now certified. It's like being what certified as a financial advisor really means nothing. You know, it's, it's an interpretive term versus like a CPA. Yes, that is, that means you've passed, you know, the CPA ex exam and, and other things that have gone into schooling behind that. But like financial planner, advisors, you know, some of these things are very nebulous. Um, and that's where a school safety expert comes in. So I'm at this conference and first of all, it's a mix of experts and vendors. And it's weird because they both present. So the vendors get up on stage and will present about whatever with surveillance cameras and the field experts will present. What they're usually doing is they're pitching themselves or their product, but it's not there to inform. It's not like my May 22nd, 2013 presentation on school safety. It's not like that on PBS. So, you know, they're, I also come to this, I guess, with a bias because um, there wasn't much new for me to learn. And so I'm rather cynical as I'm sitting there in the audience. I'm skeptical. I'm, you know, watching others present. And again, most of these are self-serving agendas. But I guess I know that because I'm there and I know what it's about. So I'm going to be respectful, um, but I'm probably not going to take out a lot of new information or a lot of information that's going to inform my practice from this conference. But, you know, it's one of those things. You're in the field. You need to, to be aware of what others are presenting, what others are talking about. And something really interesting happened here. One of the veteran experts, somebody I knew, um, and, you know, I tip my hat to this person. They worked in law enforcement. They worked in a school district. So they did have street credibility, but they had a very bizarre presentation. And here's how it started. So this man begins his presentation with an amazing example of confirmation bias and headline research. Headlines appear on the screen. So the room gets dark and suddenly up on the screen, like in a movie theater, you know, this music starts pounding and these headlines pop up. And at first they're a little bit slow, maybe up for, you know, three, four seconds. And then there's a reporter's voice over the top, like a, sh a shooting at this school. And why do we have this shooting? Another school shooting, school shootings out of control and, and things like that. And the pace picks up and it's faster and it's flashing on the screen. All of these different headlines after headlines after headlines after headlines, cutting into the next, interrupting the next, the reporter speaking, getting cut off by another reporter. And it is just crazy, maybe a hundred seconds of this, just at a frenetic pace. And then it stops. So maybe in that time, you know, maybe in that time he he literally has had, you know, 75 headlines that have that have just flashed on the screen all negative about schools school safety screen goes dark lights come on the presenter's standing there silent and he's looking down he's not looking at the audience looking down and it's a number of seconds so he's doing this for dramatic effect right and then he turns to the audience lifts his head and i think he just squarely faces all of us and he said that ladies and gentlemen, is the urgency of school safety in America. Wow. You know what? He's totally wrong. He's wrong. He's effective. He was effective, but he was wrong. What he did is he basically built research just upon headlines. Headline research, I call it. So headlines are headlines. They're not research. There's no institutional review board that approved that headline. <laughs> that headline isn't the title of a study. It's not the title of a research project, national data, whatever. It's a headline from a newspaper. Okay. Um, and it's a newspaper that probably was working to blurt that headline out, to get that out, to get that out in print, 
to get it out in a newscast before the station a mile down the road, which was just going to do the same thing. So it doesn't matter how accurate you are in news, right? It matters if you're first. Because if you're first, you're pretty much vetted. And it's kind of easier to ask for forgiveness, right? That's, that's the philosophy. And especially if you're national media or if you're regional media. My friend TJ Martinell is a reporter for The Lens in Washington State. He mentioned several times, he said, you know, media is very different if it is your hometown media. And let's say it's a town of 5,000 and the reporter um, puts out something that is adversely responded to by the town. Well, they know where that newspaper office is. They can show up right there at the door demanding to meet with that reporter or the editor, cancel subscriptions that can have a substantial effect. Now, if this is a regional or national news outlet putting this you know, information out there, has no ill effect. They're not apologizing. They're not retracting anything. They just move on. And that's what's happening. And that's what he did. That's what he did. That's what this colleague of mine did. It was amazing. It was captivating. And it made you seem like everything was going wrong. Like it, it made you feel everything's falling apart. It's horrible. It's horrible. So very effective in what he did. But what he did wasn't right. So I'm a researcher, though. You know, I I do my own work. I, I understand the scientific model. I understand hypotheses and variables and constructs and all of that that go with research. I use JURN, J-U-R-N dot org, to obtain a lot of my research content and other sources too, but JURN. Um, you will find a lot of studies which are fresh. Um, they haven't been corrupted by bias of a sponsor, <laughs> of a corporate sponsor. So uh, sometimes they're dissertations, and there's a lot of dissertations that are done really well in school safety, if just safety in general, school violence. So I'm not a big fan of, of the Google Scholar. Um, I think it's poorly curated for genuine um, current safety research and anything out there that looks kind of interesting. It's like, you have access to this if you pay this price. I don't find that so much on Jern. So I wrote about, again, this headline research in my book and said so this is really a problem because people, if you take parents, if you, if you swap out this, this colleague's presentation, so all of us in the audience, I, it was effective, but again, most people are already kind of have this confirmation bias. This is what they want to hear. They want to hear that their their work is urgent and this they this is job security and they they need to be at this conference. And that's one side of it, sure. But you put this man in front of an audience of parents who are worried maybe after there's been a school shooting, you know, 50 miles away or something like that. You bring him in for an evening presentation and you do that same introduction, and those parents are going to be eating out of his hand. If he said, if he stopped his presentation after that and said, you need to buy these bollards, you need to buy these surveillance cameras, you need to buy these bulletproof whiteboards or smart boards or whatever it is, and I'm selling all of these, and guess what? I brought my van, and we have them up here, and your school board needs to buy them. They're being bought, all right? Whether that principal's buying them, the PTA is buying them, the school board is going to act to buy them because the parents are going to put so much pressure on because they've just seen this 100-second flash after flash after flash of headline and the headline they don't want to see is their school. That's the next headline. So it's really powerful. Here's what Wikipedia says for confirmation bias. Now, normally I'm not like I'm not citing Wikipedia and research and things like this, but I, this is pretty well done. So let's talk about it. I'm going to just read the entry. Confirmation bias, also called um Confirmatory bias, or my side bias, is the tendency to search for, interpret, favor, and recall information in a way that confirms one's pre-existing beliefs or hypotheses. 
So if I want to believe that this is the state of school safety, I will believe that. Now, maybe there's somebody that presents in another sectional that I go to that says, you know what, things are trending in a positive direction for students using school reporting systems and whatever, whatever. When I leave that conference, I'm probably tuning that person out because what I'm there for, I'm, I'm there for the guy that's telling me everything's going crazy. And, you know, then that's why I need to jump into this and I got to be super alert and all of that on everything coming out in school safety. But anyway, confirmation bias is a type of cognitive bias and a systemic error of inductive reasoning. People display this bias when they gather or remember information selectively or when they interpret it in a biased way. The effect is stronger for emotionally charged issues, school safety, right? and or deeply entrenched beliefs. Beliefs such as, we can fortify our way to safety, it's worked. Right, Maginot Line, right, France? Confirmation bias is a variation of the more general tendency of apophenia. Let's not worry about that. People also tend to interpret ambiguous evidence as supporting their existing position. Ambiguous evidence, 75 headlines. That's not evidence, that's headlines. Bias search interpretation and memory have been invoked to explain attitude polarization. When a disagreement becomes more extreme, even though the different parties are exposed to the same evidence. Belief perseverance, when beliefs persist after the evidence for them is shown to be false. So that's where, if I can come out and say, you know what, it's more important to have two-way radio communications than it is to have surveillance because of whatever. Or bollard fencing has these definite drawbacks from the state of Ohio uh, releasing a report saying they've had bicyclist deaths, runners who have been killed by running into these things or maimed or things like that. People, even though you'll put that information out there, it's like, okay, thanks for telling us. Um we're going to order the bullards anyway. So it's like, whoa, like I just told you all of this and that it's not, we don't really have people driving into schools through the front doors with cars and stuff like that. Got it. And I just told you that putting bullards in has a lot of drawbacks also. Got it. Okay. Dave, we're putting the bullards in. Thanks. We'll see you. All right. A series of psychological experiments in the 1960s suggested that people are biased toward confirming their existing beliefs. This is where you really got to have your member checks. I've talked about that in previous podcasts. I talk about it in my book. I actually recognize my member checks in my book, thanking them. These are the people who are going to be brutally honest with you, and they're going to say, you know what, you're off base on this, or like you're right on, like I can see where you're coming from, this is valid. But it is the person, it is in my book when one of my colleagues called me before a board meeting and said, my board is about to act on a significant purchase of high definition cameras for the purpose of school safety, but what we've been told is if there is a school shooting, the police would instantly be able to access our camera system, track down the shooter, and I said, whoa, like I can tell this isn't sitting well with you. I'll be a, an honest member check. Um, that's that's not happening. That's not the way that this works. Most of these uh, intruder events, first, are very, very rare. And the second is that they're, they're done by the time the police arrive. And the fact that the police are going to be able to interface with this and track the person. They're, you're, I mean, how do you know that person from other people and then I asked, have you done a study, a safety study of what your needs are? Because most times when I go to districts, they will mention that their two-way radio communications um, are insufficient, that they're, obviously there's, a, you know, brick and mortar school structures. It's hard to communicate from one building to another, even before you think of communicating building to building without a repeater. So he'll say, no, we didn't do that. I said, well, don't you? think there should be like a comprehensive study and a priority? He's like, yeah, I do. Like, I get it. Like, I, I that's why I'm calling you, but we're going to vote on this. They're going to vote. So I, this, I don't feel right about this. I said, well, your, your gut instinct is correct. And I'm your member check, and I'm saying, I would shut this down. So you have to read the book to see how that one turns out. Um, so 
Confirmation biases contribute to overconfidence in personal beliefs and can maintain or strengthen beliefs in the face of contrary evidence. Poor decisions due to these biases have been found in political and organizational context. It's really when you're shutting yourself down to new information that's coming in, or you get overconfident in your ability to handle situations. Um, that, you know, for example, you know, the, the overconfidence, um, let's say that if, you know, if it was a fire and a fire department response, you know, like I've, I've mentioned, I've, uh, was a firefighter, uh, years ago. And it would be if you got to a scene of a fire or, you know, emergency event and you realized that the, your resources were insufficient for that event, um, you know, you'd need to call in mutual aid, you need to call in others, but maybe you have this overconfidence, this bias of saying, it's not as, we've handled stuff like this before, it's not as bad as what it looks like and whatever, and then pretty soon you get in over your head. That does happen from time to time. Um, but yeah, this whole overconfidence and personal beliefs, your, your bias. So it's like, you know, you come up and you're not really reading this fire scene accurately of, of saying, you know, this, this is larger, there's more combustible things here. We only have so many gallons of water out with us. You know, we really need to get mutual aid versus if we do all of these things fall in place, we pull it off before it'll probably work right now. Confirmation bias in schools. So let's talk about what this looks like, how it impacts schools. Remember, people will seek information that supports their beliefs. I can recognize this immediately. When I'm asked to consult in a school district and, and I feel that I'm not a fit, <laughs> I'm not the person you really were looking for, not that I don't have the skill set to consult in your district. It's just maybe you have a different bias, a different belief in what school safety is. And that belief probably is, Dave, we really believe fortification is the path to school safety. If that's your belief, I'm not your guy. Um, again, I'm not saying that that's wrong. I'm saying that's incomplete. It's fortification. And then the other side of that, two sides of the coin, um, would be safety instruction and threat um, identification and reporting, that you need to balance those out. And that's not balanced. So when I'm brought in, um, I, I can only back that position to a certain extent. And it's it's awkward. But again, I know I, I'm honest. That's, that's you have to be as a school safety expert saying, I think you're looking for someone. I can help you with these things. I can only go so far into these areas and then you're better off with somebody else. And if this is your philosophy, that's your philosophy, okay? It's not going to be my philosophy. So we're, we're going to see things differently here. And usually, you know, that's, that's fine. You know, then um, I try to make it very um, explicit up front of here's the service that I will provide to you. And when we talk about fortification, my work in that, I'm not the person who's going to walk around your school and say, that entrance is safe. Those windows need to be locked or there needs to be like a bulletproof film put on the bottom two feet of it or something like that. I'm not your guy. That's not my area of expertise. But I am the person that can come in and say, how are you training staff about what to do when there's a lockdown or when a student starts to show signs of possibly cutting or says, you know, there's something not right with my friend. They're spending a lot of time on their phone. They're becoming more secretive. I'm your person to help with that. And your induction process. What happens when somebody joins your school or a student mid-year? I'm your guy. So confirmation biases often assume there's some type of research conducted, but I found that's just not accurate. And again, it's more like my colleague in his headlines. So when he gets done, he seems like this, this deep knowledge base, this well um, who has all of this research, but he has no research. He has headlines. So again, confirmation bias, true confirmation bias, I think needs to have some sort of research element. So 
what is happening here is confirmation bias, but it's not even like a true confirmation bias. It's not like I'm presented with three research studies and I kind of ignore the two that have findings that don't support my position. These aren't even to that depth. These are reporters putting out headlines. So it is kind of the the most superficial level of confirmation bias. But this is what people vet these days, right? This is where people vet. They go all in. They push all of the chips in right here. This is where they vet. They go with this. I'm behind this. This headline, it's first out there. I'm not going to confirm it, check it. It's vetted. Confirmation bias will prevent systems from evolving because new thinking is dismissed. You're not going to move forward if you're not letting new thinking into the process, new knowledge. And if you're only hearing what you want to hear, okay, if you're only hearing what you want to hear, it's kind of like, um, you know, it, it, it's it's like complimenting the king on, you know, it's, it's such a fine wardrobe and, and stuff like that, or the yes people. You're only hearing what you want to hear. You will not improve your systems in that regard. If anything, your, your systems will continue to degrade and you'll just keep getting positive news because that's the news that you'll attend to or else that's the news that people will give you because they know that will keep you happy and maybe you're in a leadership position and if you're happy, it makes their lives easier. Another problem with confirmation and bias is that you incorrectly perceive your environment. So, and this happens for students too. Here's an example confirmation bias. Somebody is walking around a school that you don't recognize and um, they don't have a name badge on or anything like that from the school. And let's just say they have a yellow vest on. That's it. They have a yellow vest, but that's it. And so you're looking at this confirmation bias. It's like, well, most times when people are with a vest or something, they're working on something. So either they're from the city and they're in here doing something or there's something mechanical with the school to HVAC system. So whatever, this person should be here. They're vetted. They, this person must belong here. Or even if it's a, if it's a student and if that student is, is behaving awkwardly or picking something up, kind of this uncanny valley type thing in a way. But if you have this strong confirmation bias, it's just like, well, I, it seem, it's probably okay, right? It's probably okay. Probably this person should be here. That can be devastating. So we talk about situational awareness. We get into that in the book, um, how to practice that. And this, this it really gets at where um, we, we've, we've got we've to recognize when confirmation bias is happening and then interrupt it with situational awareness. So... This is from the explorable.com. It's selective group participation. Fascinating little story to talk about regarding confirmation bias. It is. It was a case study by Hastorf and Cantrell. I'm going to read through it here as we bring a close to this episode of the Safety Doc Podcast. So Hastorf and Cantrell's case study analyzed what proved to be selective group perception of a football game contested between the Dartmouth Indians and the Princeton Tigers. The football game the students watched had been played in 1951 and in the game Princeton won. It was a tough game with a lot of penalties and caused uproar in a series of editorials in campus newspapers. Okay, so the game was played in 1951. All right. The Princeton quarterback, who was an All-American in his last game for college, left the game in the second quarter with a broken nose and a mild concussion. When third quarter came, Dartmouth quarterback ended up with a broken leg after being tackled in the backfield. Rough day for him. A week after the game, Hastorf and Cantrell asked both Dartmouth and Princeton students of psychology to answer a questionnaire. All right. You know my issues with surveys and questionnaires, but... In this case, so the students who were, um, so the week after the game, the two researchers asked both Dartmouth and Princeton students, not students who necessarily were at the game, but students in the psychology program to answer a questionnaire. So Dartmouth students in psychology, Princeton students in the psychology program. The researchers then analyzed and interpreted the answers of those who had seen the game either in real or in recorded Movies. So they also had, they were kind of comparing like people who had actually seen it, people who had heard about it. 
they had two other groups view a film of the game and then tabulate it, the number of infractions seen. So that's kind of the, the true baseline of, okay, what, was, what actually transpired in this game? After showing a film of the game, Princeton students saw the Dartmouth team make over twice as many rule violations as were seen by Dartmouth students. The researchers interpret this as a manifestation of selective group perception or confirmation bias. They interpret these results overall as indicating that when encountering a mix of occurrences as complex as a football game, we experience primarily those events that fulfill a familiar pattern and have a personal relevance to us. As someone who went to every Green Bay Packers home game in the 1990s, of course, you think that there was pass interference on the other team or that they were out of bounds or anything like that. And if it was your player, um, nope, even though it's on the Jumbotron, you can clearly see a sliver of green between their foot and the sideline, right? You can always see that when it's your team. Kind of funny because back in those days, it's pretty grainy, you know, the Jumbotrons, not the super high def stuff they have today. Back to the study. For the students of each school, a selective group perception and memory of what might seem to be the same event, so it's one game, one football game, right, involved a very active construction of different realities. Dartmouth remembered it one way, Princeton another. Our membership in a group often provides us a frame and a filter through which we view social events, skewing our perceptions. The said game definitely left a mark on the students from both schools, marked by different views also to those people who felt no allegiance to either of the teams. And even those belonging to the same group, the game meant different things to the team members and their fans. This particular case study demonstrates the crucial role of values in shaping one's perception and judgment. Albert Hastorf and Hadley Cantrell's case study was published in the Journal of Abnormal and Social Psychology in 1954. In conclusion, the experiment was used as evidence that out of all the occurrences going on in the environment, a person selects only those that might have some significance for him from his own egocentric position in the total matrix that the game actually has many different games and that each version of the events that transpired was just as true and real to a particular person as other versions were to other viewers and fans. So basically, every person in the stands, so let's say there's 25,000 people in the stands, the game is unique to them, what they're seeing in that game, what they're taking away. And collectively, if you're on the Dartmouth side, if you're on the Princeton side, you have some bias that you're bringing into that game, some confirmation bias where it's like our team did better or our team you know, was held back because of the referees or the dirty play of the other team or whatever. But actually, everybody is kind of perceiving this game individually. So let me read that again because I, I just think this is incredible. This is like so ahead of its time the statement. Okay. Again, this is from 1954. In conclusion, the experiment was used as evidence that out of all the occurrences going on in the environment, a person selects only those that have some significance for him from his own egocentric position in the total matrix that the game actually was many different games, and that each version of the events that transpired was just as true and real to a particular person as other versions were to other viewers and fans. Wow. In this study, it was found that the participants' perceptions were skewed and were easily influenced by their motives. You know, I want my team to win, unwearing, unwearingly, and motivated by their motives, influenced by their motives. It just proves that people sometimes only see what they want to see. There were people that left that morning who put on their wool sweatshirt for Princeton who, no matter what happened that day, if uh, Princeton won that game, you know, 58 to zero, they deserved to win it. Um, they were the best team coming in. Princeton is awesome. All the players work harder than the other players. If they would have lost 58 to zero, um, it was, you know, the, the refs, the other team it was unfair. There were other factors at play, you know, maybe because of, where it was played, the field wasn't, you know, there were other reasons, other factors that came into this, right? 
The researchers arrived at the following conclusion. In brief, the data here indicate that there is no such thing as a game existing out there in its own right, which people merely observe. The game exists for a person and is experienced by him only insofar as certain happenings have significances in terms of his purpose. So, wow. Wow. Okay. So, what does this all mean for application? Well, a, a good way of countering this is to be either sympathetic or I would say empathic or, or try to put ourselves into someone else's shoes so we can see it from their perspective. Actually work with people on this and say, you know, what is the perspective of the parent in this case? Or administrator, what is the perspective of the teacher? Teacher, what is the perspective of the school board member? And or working with other students um, on perspective taking. Why, why do you think somebody might have responded to you this, this way? And then when you're able to do that, that, that helps a lot. It's, it's early steps to debate, right? It really is. If it, because debate is about perspective taking, trying to understand the person that holds a position opposite or different than yours, why they have the position and why they're trying to justify it, what research, what data they're using, what might have happened to them, their own personal experiences of why they're, they're advocating for this position. And at least then you understand it. You can say, I, I understand, I've studied your position and this is what I understand about it. And you can help clarify if I don't understand it. And at least you can agree that you understand their tenets of their position. You don't have to agree with their position you might have a position that you you try to then persuade them to, but at least you understand their position, which we don't spend a lot of time really doing that today anyway, enough time. So this way we can see situations more comprehensively, objectively, and more justly. So confirmation bias, or again, kind of only tuning in to what supports your position. And it's like researchers who are very disappointed in findings that don't su support their hypothesis, maybe. And it's like, well, you know, you did the research and, and the findings invalid. And if, if, if it's reliable, you do other research studies and this is your finding and it's different than what you thought. That's actually, it's good research. Um, the research isn't to prove your point. You don't research to prove your point. You research to have evidence surface in a study that then you interpret these evi this evidence or these findings and you have a discussion ab about it. So when people get that mixed up, it's like, I, I, I want this to be so true and I want this to be so accurate that whatever level of Bullard fortification in front of schools. And uh, so, so you, you do research, but you only research people with questions about, you know, like, um, uh, how, how much has Bullard um, fencing increased your school's, uh, your perception that this is a safe campus? So that's a leading question, right? And so then you have, you know, like a little bit, um, somewhat, or a whole lot, like three choices. But you don't have like zero, like it hasn't increased it at all. So, and again, it's studies, it's research, it's articles that come out and things like, like that or, or data sets if they don't align with your position, you're just kind of like, ah, it's out there. It exists. But, well, this is the Safety Doc, David Proden. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode. And remember, we have attorney James Sibley coming up for episode 95. So thank you so much. Please follow on Twitter at SafetyPhD or check out SafetyPhD.com for all of the shows, all of the blog posts. We are on Podbean, Apple Podcast, on YouTube for video, safetyphd.com, and purchase School of Airs. School of Airs, Rethinking School Safety in America, available now through Amazon, Barnes & Noble, others.
This has been the Safety Doc Podcast with author, radio show host, and leading safety expert, Dr. David Perotti. Remember to check back each week for the latest, best, and most bizarre practices in safety preparation and crisis response. You can find Dr. Perotin on Twitter at SafetyPhD. And remember, the truth will keep you safe.